you go out into the woods often enough and you like to use sharp things like knives and hatchets and axes and saws, chances are at some point you're going to cut yourself. Now, the very best prevention is learning how to use your tools safely. Even so, things happen. And when they do, you need to be prepared. You need to have a first aid kit. Well, I've got two first aid kits I want to share with you today from the, co the company MyMedic. One of their smallest, the Hiker, and their second largest, the Recon. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on these two kits, keep watching. All right, before we get started, just a few things I want to mention. First, I'd like to thank the company MyMedic for sending out these two first aid kits so that I can share them with you. Now, of course, the big disclaimer, I am not a doctor. In no way should you interpret anything I'm about to say or anything I'm about to show you as first aid training. It is not. Having said that, though, I do have some experience in this area. I worked for 36 years as a police officer in a major metropolitan area. In addition, I worked part-time for 15 years as a paramedic. I also volunteered with the Canadian Red Cross Society as a senior master instructor trainer for first aid and first responder courses. Okay, next thing I want to say is a first aid kit in no way can be viewed as a replacement for first aid training. Before you even consider buying a first aid kit, go out and get first aid training. You, that's so, so important. I can't stress that enough. Okay, so you've gotten your first aid training and you're looking to buy a kit. Now, before you purchase the kit, consider what are the circumstances you're going to be using it in. For us who go out into the woods, we want to look at the things that are most likely to happen to us. What are the injuries and the illnesses that we may face? And then you build your kit around that. Or you purchase a kit with items in it that you know how to use. And that's the next thing I want to say. When you've made a decision on your first aid kit, bring it home, open it up, and dump it out on the table. Look through everything in the kit. Make sure you know how to use them. If there are items in there that were not covered in your first aid training and you're not sure about how to use them properly, take them out of the kit. The one exception would be if you're going out with a group and someone else in the group has more advanced training and knows how to use some of those items, maybe you want to leave them in the kit then. The other thing you want to do, of course, is look at the kit and make sure it has everything that you do know how to use and you're going to want to use. You may end up adding a few things to the kit. All right, having said all of that, what I want to do now is take you down to the table and basically dump these kits out on the table one at a time show you their contents, talk a few, uh, make a few comments on my experiences using them. All right, as I mentioned in the opening, my medic sent out two kits for me to share with you. The smaller of the two being this one, the Hiker Med Pack, and the other being the Recon. And what I'm going to do, of course, is leave you all the information regarding the weights and size of the pack and everything in the video description, as well as the link where you can take a look at it. This is the Hiker at $29.95 US dollars at the time of this recording. And as you can see, the first thing I did when I got it home is rip it open because it does come sealed. It does have a Ziploc uh, mechanism on the top, but everything is, is inside sealed up. And a lot of people will leave their kits that way in their backpack, hoping, and that's what I'm thinking, hoping that if they ever needed it, they could open it up and figure out what to do then. Now, in fairness, there is a complete list of contents on the back for everything that is in here. But once again, I recommend take it out and make sure you know how to use it. Plus, I'm going to recommend that you take a few things out of this and leave them out. You can put them somewhere else in your pack, but I don't believe they belong in this kit. And the last thing I'll say before taking everything out is you may want to replace the bag. The bag is really temporary. That's the best way I can say it. It's not easy to access the items you want. There's a good chance that it, when you need it, if you need something right now, you're going to rip it open and dump everything on the ground and you may not be able to find or you may get them wet and make them useless. So I do suggest that you want to look at some other kit or bag to put all of the stuff in. So let's just start taking things out. I'll show you what's in here. I'll talk about the value of each and we'll go from there. All right, put the bag aside. All right, so there's a few things in the kit right away that I would leave out. One is paracord. Now, somebody's going to say, yes, my, my paracord is really important. Everybody should have some cordage with them because you never know when you're going to need the cordage. I agree totally. I just don't think it belongs in a first aid kit. Put it some, Take it out, put it out somewhere else in your pack, and if you need it for some type of an emergency or just ever whatever you're doing, whatever projects you're making, then yes, 
then you have some, some paracord. So it's nice that they provide it. I just don't think it belongs in the kit. One, it takes up a whole lot of space. So I'm going to put that well out of the way. The next is this whistle. Yes, a whistle is an important piece of equipment to have when you're out in the woods. Mine is hanging right on the strap of my backpack so that I have it. Should I go down and can't get up, I can start whistling if I hear somebody nearby so I can attract their attention. So a whistle is a good thing, but again, I don't think it belongs in a first aid kit. All right. Space blankets. We could go on at length about space blankets, and this is the one that'll probably be the most controversial for people and whether it belongs in a first aid kit. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a space blanket is capable of. People will say that, well, it's better off having this than having nothing. And that may be true as long as you know how to properly use a space blanket. It's not a blanket per se. It is a windshield, it is a reflective piece of material that will reflect heat back to your body and it's a signaling device, but it is not a warm blanket. That's the best way to say it. So you can, we can talk about this in another video, but that's something else I would take out and put somewhere else in my pack. Good to have, but not in your first aid kit. All right, so that brings us to the contents that are worth bring, uh, having here. So there are a number of different packets of, of, of uh, uh, band-aids, band-aids, of course. So a band-aid, by the way, is a bandage and a dressing. That's what a band-aid is. A band-aid was a brand name, but it's a, often, you know, it goes by a number of different names. I like these, and there was actually two packages of them in here. I opened one up and started using some of the uh, band-aids inside. I like these because there is a good variety of shapes and sizes, and band-aids is probably the thing you're going to use most often when you're out in the woods for all those minor things. So have a good supply of band-aids of various sizes to fit the wound, not only the size and the shape of the wound, but the location on the body. So really band-aids you almost can't have too many of, but at least a, a variety of different sizes is important to have. So put those aside and, and I guess we, we should talk about the risk. What are you going to use a band-aid for? Well, a band-aid can be all kinds of things. Obviously, little cuts and scrapes is one of the things that we're most going to likely consider a band-aid for, but they're also not bad if you're starting to blister on your feet. There is better materials and this kit does include it, but they are some of the more common injuries as things that a band-aid will work for. So we'll put those aside. Now, I mentioned... Uh, oh, this is the third package. Third package of Band-Aids, just a little larger in size, so you get an assortment of slightly larger uh, Band-Aids. I do like that they come in these sealed packages, and you get graphic image of the Band-Aid that's inside. So really, don't have to open these up until you need them, but uh, because that'll keep them clean and sterile, or to the best that you can. But uh, this, this one is built a little bit bigger because it's meant to handle a little bit more trauma, if you will, a larger cut maybe on it. I'm not going to say this is great for if you really cut yourself and you're bleeding freely, this is not going to cover it. That'll be a something else. And it's not even what you need for that. It's not even in this kit. We'll mention that in a moment. All right. Blisters are a common item. Now, a common thing to have happen. So blisters and chafing, they give a variety of moleskins and little pads for that. Great idea. Um, I carry a few pieces of moleskin in my personal kit. I also carry duct tape. I also carry, carry kinesiology tape, which I actually think is the best material, as long as it's not a full-on blister. If you have a full-on blister, you're going to need more than, than just a piece of tape over it. But, yep, yeah, okay, that's agreed. Uh, that should be in the kit. No problem at all. Sun exposure. Um, there is both a sunscreen and something to wipe over a sunburn. Uh, you could call these first aid requirements, but honestly, I don't believe that they are. They are something I do carry in my pack. When I'm out in the summer, I try to dress long sleeves to, for most of the time and always wear a hat. Uh, that not only protects me from the sun as well as cuts and bruises or cuts and scrapes going through the woods, but also ticks. So I don't have a whole lot of exposed areas. So you, this won't hurt to have in your kit, I guess. To me, it's just something that should be somewhere else in your kit. Uh, maybe not at all. And it does take up space. However, it's not a bad thing. It won't it's, it's something everybody can use, I guess we can say. Whether it's in your first aid kit, I'll leave that up to you. Electrolytes. 
This is another one of those items that you might consider, should it be in a first aid kit? I'll argue yes. Now, I carry electrolyte packets like these, different brand, in my food bag because I know that when I'm uh, filtering out a bottle of water, if I've been working hard and I'm building up a perspiration, then I'm going to need to replace the electrolytes. So I'll mix up it up in my water bottle, drink it down, have my hydration covered. Uh, for someone who has not been actively taking care of their hydration, then yes, this could be somewhat of an emergency. However, having said that, when you give the person this is all important. To not try to give the person electrolytes if they're semi-conscious or unconscious. You need them to be able to swallow safely and not give get water or anything else down into their lungs. So important to have, and I'll agree, yes, they do belong in a first aid kit, but it doesn't hurt to have them for yourself in your food bag or whatever else you carry. Electrolytes are very important. Most people do neglect these. And uh, yeah, that's enough said about that. Okay, next small one is uh, medications. So this is something that had traditionally been left out of first aid training. But in this case, I think now we all recognize everybody should have medications. So there's two categories of medications. First off, if you have any prescribed medications that you cannot go without for an extended period of time, whether it's for a heart condition or anything else, you should have those medications in your kit. Reason being is, if you had to stay out overnight or for any length of time, you want to make sure that you have those essential medications. The medications in this one are more about pain relievers. So there's ibuprofen, aspirin. Uh, well, there is a diarrhea, nausea medication. There's a motion sickness medication, an allergy relief, an anti-diarrhea relief, and some cold and fever reducers, which is probably Tylenol or uh, uh, it doesn't actually say what the, what the medication is. It would on the inside. I did not open this up. I don't feel the need to. I know that these medications are all common over-the-counter one. And whether you buy medications to put in your kit or buy a kit with a packet like this, I do believe that is a good choice to have in your first aid kit. Now, the rest of these, these are kind of in the same category as, we'll say, the space blanket maybe. These are bug repellent wipes. Okay, uh, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with having these in the kit, but again, I don't think it's something that necessarily should be in a kit. Should you have bug repellents? That's a personal decision. If you have a lot of biting mosquitoes and black flies and like my area, the deer flies or the horse flies, yeah, I'm going to take something with me but it won't be these little towelettes. I'll have spray bottles, I'll have whatever else or lotions that I can put on my skin. Um, so I wouldn't call this a first aid item, but having a bug spray, I think, in your kit somewhere is worth having. By the way, this is non-DEET, so uh, it's citronella-based, so it's, it's not one of the DEET products, and a lot of people will appreciate that. And I got one, two, three little packages of that. On top of that, I got two sting relief. Okay, I will say the sting relief ones are not a bad idea to have in your first aid kit because some people react to stings uh, unexpectedly and, and maybe a major allergic reaction, which is can be, if they weren't aware of it and didn't have an, an EpiPen with them, can be kind of dangerous. This is not to replace an EpiPen, don't mistake that. This is to take the itch and sting and some of the swelling out of a kit, so you're not constantly rubbing at it, or out of a bite, sorry, so you're not constantly rubbing at it. If you had a severe allergic reaction to any type of a bug bite, that is something you need to be prepared for, most likely with an epi pen and some type of antihistamine like Benadryl. Again, that's separate, but maybe you add that to your kit. All right, so that's the contents of this first aid kit. Overall, not bad, right? This will cover most of the small things that will happen out on the trail if you're a hiker. What it won't cover is the things that we as bushcrafters are likely to encounter when we start playing with sharp things and we start handling hot things. This is really does not cover that. So now it's time to move up to a larger first aid kit. All right, the next kit I have to show you is the Recon, and it was sent to me in red. It does come in other colors, so if you're not that uh, fond of the red color and you want just a regular olive green, whatever, black, whatever it is, camo, they have those packs available. That's what this is. This is a small backpack, and uh, yeah, it's 
It's quite the kit. Now, honestly, it was much larger than I would was expecting anything to be sent to me. And it's more than I will ever use, to be quite honest. If I was a part of a recon team in the military, of course, they would have outfit the, those teams with their own items. But this is the type of kit, something much larger, something more comprehensive. It's meant for more than just applying to ourselves. It's not a self-aid kit. Now, the items can be applied, so most of them anyway can be applied to ourselves. But there's enough kit here to handle injuries on other people, a number of other people, all at the same time. All right, so... What I'm going to do is open this up and just literally spread it out over the table because it takes up a lot of space. Here's my first comment. Oh my, was this ever packed tight. This was packed so tight that when I emptied it out the first time and then tried to put everything back in, I couldn't get the stuff in. Not without jamming it in. So what does that say? There's going to be things in here that I'm going to suggest you take out and leave out to give yourself some space. Now, the other thing is there's a whole range of kits in between that little tiny hiker one I showed you and this large one. By the way, there is a kit larger than this, believe it or not. So you can imagine it's not for the average person to take out. This is large groups primarily. But there are items in here that, yes, I know from my experience in training how to use, but the average person will not. And uh, I'll show them as I go along. All right, I'm just going to empty it up all over the table and then we'll come back and start going through them. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm quickly going to show you the packet itself because it's worth a couple of comments and then I'll take the pack off the table because the, everything is spread out all over this table. There, In a number of cases there are duplicate things in here that, well, it, it'll, I'll only show you the one. So the basic recon kit retails right now, at least at the time of this recording, at $239.95 US dollars and I'll give you all the specs and the link and everything else in the video description. Here's what I like about the bag itself. It provides you some options on the way you're going to transport or carry this. Again, this one, as I mentioned, is really intended for larger groups where somebody is going to be carrying this probably nothing else but just this. But that really is only something that a medic might do in a larger group. So I guess if you're on a multi-day outing, somebody's going to want to take a larger kit that they can use for multiple or serious injuries. So just going over it, it is a little backpack. It has shoulder straps and it has a spot down inside here. It would be a hydration uh, spot in a lot of kits, but it does offer you a place where you can slide something else inside, something that you want to get at real, real quick. And I can mention a few things as we go along, just a little dome snap to keep that shut. Inside the first pocket, and it's just an open zip pocket, is a shoulder strap. So uh, you can uh, uh, not don't have to carry it on your back. You can use the shoulder strap attached to these two D-rings if you want. Again, you could take that out and use that for a few more things. I guess the number of pockets on this allows you some organization. And that's important because if you're become familiar with this kit, you need to pack it yourself so you know where things are because you don't want to be dumping things all over the ground, searching for the thing you need right away. You want to be able to go right to it and know exactly where it is or to be able to tell someone else where to look for it in the bag so they can bring it to you, whether you're applying it to yourself or you can't leave the injured person to go get it. All right, so let's just start on the front with the two big pockets. So the, the pocket on the bottom here, and I literally pulled it open like that for a reason because one of the things that you start to lose in an emergency is fine motor coordination. Searching for and grabbing on to toggle, zipper toggles like this becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, you can do it sometimes and not always, especially if your hands are cold. So I like that you can grab a pack and just rip it open and access everything in it. So there is a couple of stretch pockets inside here and this one being zippered. All right, so that's not bad. You can actually put a few things in there and you'll know what it is that you're going for. Same thing at the top, there's another zippered pouch and it provides you a small mesh pocket here and two elasticized pockets here. And I will tell you what was in there in a few moments time. You may decide to organize your pack that way and maybe you won't at the same time. Let me just put this other front pocket up. And then there's the main compartment. And here's the main compartment. Now the main compartment is fairly well laid out a lot of the stuff that was in here was in here loose. There is a big mesh pocket on the back, one on each side. 
mesh pocket here with a zipper, another mesh pocket here with a zipper, and a couple more elasticized keepers down here. Again, you're going to have to decide where do you want to organize things. Maybe this is the little band-aids and wipes and medications, or the medications go here. It depends on what you feel you're likely to need. I like that you can rip it open, and then you can just kind of dive in and grab what you want. Uh, there was just too much stuff in here, that's to be honest. Okay, that's everything about the pack, and let's put the pack aside, and I'll sit down and start going through these things. Now, I wasn't kidding when I said I've got it spread out all over the table. This is going to become a little bit challenging, so I'm going to start showing you things, and I'll mention whether I believe it belongs in the pack, uh, or is it something you should have specialized training for, or is it something that just belongs out of the pack altogether? Let me just turn the camera down a little bit so we can kind of cover the whole table's worth here. It won't necessarily be in the order of most important to least important. We'll have to, you'll have to decide that for yourself based on your training. I know I keep saying that, but based on your training. All right, two things right up front. They were in that little tiny pocket at the top so that they're there for quick, rapid use. These are CPR face shields for doing respiration breathings so that you can place them over the casualty's face and mouth and then blow into their mouth properly according to your training without risk of disease transmission or anything else coming back out of the mouth and into yours. So good to have? Yes, it, they're really good to have. At least one of them. I don't know that we need two of them. There are better devices on the market, but these at least are functional and small. So yes, I wouldn't, I'd leave one of these in the kit. Now here's the reality of using this kit in the field. And this is open to discussion and this is going to be entirely up to you. My experience is if someone goes into cardiac arrest, the survivability rate is very low. And it's not how it's not just how quickly first aid is applied, meaning CPR and, re and rescue breathing, but how quickly defibrillation, that's electrical discharge to reset the, or the uh, rhythm of the heart, can happen. Unless somebody's carrying one in the backwoods, it's not going to get to you in the time period that will make it worth doing. Having said that, there could be uh, breathing that is stopped, but a heartbeat is still beating. So that's reason enough to carry these things. So we'll just put that out there and I'll, then I'll put them aside. Okay, here's a couple of items that I think I would put in my kit. And, uh, you know, your training may cover these. Uh, I don't know, again, that I need two of them. These are chest seals. So sucking chest wounds. You've all heard of that term, a sucking chest wound. And um, it can create a, uh, a situation called a tension pneumothorax if it's not managed. And what I mean by that, you start to trap air inside of your chest, but outside of your lungs. And that compresses the lungs and makes it harder and harder for you to breathe. So this is a chest seal that can be applied. I suppose the most common would be a gunshot or a stabbing. So these were things that can be used for that purposes. There are instructions on them. I'm not going to show them to you because these instructions don't replace proper training of not only how but when to use them because there is some distinct training that goes around these things. But if you have the training for the use of these, then yes, they should be in your kit, especially if you're a hunter and you're out in the woods and or there's a, a you know a risk, I suppose, of being impaled by a stick or whatever else, then yeah, this, it's a good idea to have at least one. So I'll put those out of the way. Oh, this is kind of good. We're, we're talking about the things right at the top that really require training. These are called a nasal pharyngeal airway. They slide down through the nozzle or na <laughs> nostril into the back of the throat and they support the airway by keeping an opening so that the, when you are unconscious or the person is unconscious on their back, gravity kicks in, the tongue tends to want to fall to the back of the airway and occlude it, meaning no air is getting into their lungs. Now there's a couple things you can do, of course. One is to tilt the head and lift the chin and that physically lifts the tongue off of the back of the airway. You're not going to do that, though, if they have a neck injury, or at least a suspected neck injury. There are any number of devices designed for remedying, remedying that situation, and this is just one of them. This is the, what we call the least invasive, the least likely to cause a problem if you don't know how to use it and you give it a try. So they go in through the nose. Uh, again, this is something that really you should have some training on. And these come in different sizes, and there's some guys 
guidelines about what's the right size for the right person. Is it a child? Is it is it a uh, male, female, the size of the person? So these are in two different sizes, 20 French and 28 French. So a couple of different sizes to choose from. Everything is there that you need and they are in sterile packaging but these are something I don't recommend you open until you need them just to protect the sterility of them. But you do need to have training on how to use them. That's my opinion. All right, what else do we have here? Oh, here's a few things that you can literally just take right out of the kit. There we go. Okay. Uh, glow sticks. Okay, glow sticks have a function. Really, they do. I like them in terms of uh, signaling and, and or if you're lost, and then by all means. So this is a super light. So this one is very bright but I don't think it's bright enough to do any significant first aid with. So uh, I don't know that this belongs in a kit in terms of first aid application. You might want to have this on your person as a, as a backup, almost like a flare would be, uh, that type of thing. But don't, not, don't take up room in your first aid kit with it. That's my thought there. Same thing with a paracord, same as last time. Paracord is great to have in your kit. Extra, you can't have too much cordage. That's an old saying and it, and it is true. It just doesn't belong in the first aid kit. All right, well, let's put that aside. Boy, my trouble is going to be trying to stay organized. Okay, here's another item that requires training. And it's it. This is a lifesaver. At least, and there there are different forms of this. This is your basic tourniquet. This one is known as a rat tourniquet, rapid application tourniquet, and it, it's a. Uh, an elasticized cord is the best way to describe it. There are instructions on the back on how to use it. Really, that's not the time to figure out this out. Because if you are in a situation where yourself or somebody else is in need of a tourniquet, that's any free, uh, heavily free-flowing blood, whether it's spurting arterial blood or just free-flowing venous blood, but a lot of it, then, yep, a tourniquet is a lifesaver. Uh, you'll need to well, there's steps to take before applying a tourniquet, but it, the applying of the tourniquet is not done the first time on the, that incident. You do need to practice with these things. I'd say, yeah, by all means, take this out of the kit, get comfortable with using it if you have the training. Otherwise, leave it home. Uh, but if there is a risk of severe bleeding when you go out, then really your training should cover what to do in that situation. And a tourniquet, whether it's the rat or some of the others that are available, should be in your kit for sure. Okay, uh, what else have we got here? Burn gels. Okay, so there's controversy a while around burn gels, and burns is a complicated topic when it comes to how do you treat them, and it's complicated by a number of factors. One of the factors is how serious the burn is, it, whether it's a first, second, or third degree burn, where it's located on the body, how much of the body is encompassed by the burns, and what are your environmental conditions and how long to rescue? So the, all those things play into whether or not you, or how you should, not whether or not you treat the burn, but how you treat the burn. So having a burn dressing, yes, I can totally say is a good idea in there, but make sure, again, you know how to use it. Let's put that aside. Nitrile gloves. Oh yes, um, nitrile gloves. And really, uh, you know, uh, the, here's a couple of them. They're uh, really important to have in your kit, but here, the, you have to understand that these are for protecting the person you are treating, not yourself. If your hands have no open cuts or scrapes on them, then getting a little blood or getting a little phlegm from the person's mouth is not going to infect you. Your skin is your best protection for that. Having said that, your hands are dirty and you will infect the person if you don't protect them from you. So uh, that's reason enough to have some gloves is to be as clean as possible when you're helping another person out. So here's three, three in this kit. I think that's all I found. There's such a stash of stuff here. Three is great. And uh, yeah, I don't think you can have too many of those. Just don't take up the whole bag with them. All right, what is this one? Oh, Quick Clot. Quick Clot is, is very popular nowadays. This one is a Quick Clot dressing. It'll come out in long dressing. And the, the idea of, of Quick Clot is there is, a uh, well, there's a couple of different types, but it will cause clotting to a 
happen quickly, all right? Hence the name quick clot. And the idea is you pack the wound with it. So it won't work in every situation, but it will not only uh, cause clotting to occur, but it will also provide some packing, which can help with the application of a tourniquet or a pressure dressing, which we're, I'm sure there's one in here somewhere we can do. So there are some directions on this. Um, your first aid training may or may not cover it. Um, I would say suggest if it does not cover it, look into them, become familiar with them, and put them in your kit because they are quite important for serious bleeding situations. All right, what else have we got here? Instant cold pack. Oh, okay. Well, oh, all right. I'll say yes. It belongs in your kit, but this little tiny kit is not going to last you very long. So you may want to consider uh, when you're going to use it. It's used primarily for sprains and maybe breaks or, or that type of thing to reduce swelling and, and reduce pain. Those are good reasons to have them. Uh, what I have found is they do have a shelf life on this. This is not dated on this one, but we have dug them out before after they've been stored for an extended period of time and then they just didn't activate for whatever reason. You wouldn't think that it would if it's not exposed to the air. It shouldn't, right? But they can. They can expire over a period of time. I'll say yes to putting it in, but if you're a long ways from help, uh, ice is important. It's just going to be hard to come by and this is only going to last so long. So I'll, that's all I'll say there. All right, what else have we got in, in here? Oh, another burn mod, sorry, that's your uh, burn kit. I'm trying to go with some of the larger ones. Okay, so this is a great little kit in terms of severe bleeding. Now, there are things in here uh, for severe bleeding. Is this another one? Yes, it is. This is a dressing and a bandage. So it's got the dressing and quite a bit of it that you're going to apply directly to the bleeding and not, not for little cuts, right? This is for severe bleeding, directly to the bleeding and a gauze dressing, which is just that you wrap around and you do so with considerable amount of pressure, not so much pressure that you're cutting off all circulation to the limb, but enough pressure to keep the bleeding at bay. So yeah, this is pretty good. So the contents in this, this is the type of thing that likely is covered in your first aid training. So uh, you do want to keep them sterile because once you've had the training, then then you're, you're sure, for sure going to know how to use them. It's not all that difficult. So do keep them sterile. Don't open these up just to play with them, in other words. All right, what else have we got? Oh, here's another one, another emergency dressing. This one has been vacuum sealed, and this is very much like the Israeli dressing that a lot of people uh, like to add to their kits. It's vacuum sealed. It has the dressing and gauze all in one. So you'll put it on and just wrap it up tight. It's, it's just really a different way of packaging this type of thing up. I don't, either one, both of them. I don't know that you need three of them in here, but you have them both, or all. you have a choice, I guess, is what we're going to say there. These are compression gauzes as well. So these are also vacuum seal, uh, sealed. And the idea of here is that um, you're going to apply these. They are vacuum, really they're gauze, they're packing for large wounds. So if you have a severe cut or open wound of some type in an extremity, then these come out and they pack into the wound. Again, they are sterile and that's the way you want them to be. But when you take them out, then that's when you apply them. You just, you just unroll them or unfold them in this case and uh, apply them right into the wound. You want to take up the space in that wound. So any dressing you apply on top helps. They work together to keep the pressure on at the point of the bleeding. So yeah, those are great if you expect severe bleeding. Now we're working ourselves down. Okay, this is a term that, um, uh, that uh, it's by brand name, but these are moldable splints and they're referred to often as SAM splints and SAM splints are a great piece of kit. Basically, it's a, a malleable aluminum covered with a thin layer of foam on both sides. Uh, they are great at forming splints for all the joints and all the bones in your body. Usually one is not enough unless it's relatively minor or located, you know, how should I say, isolated to one area of the body. But again, there is technique to use in these things. It's not simply, a, you don't wrap them around, you actually form a splint and a splint being a substitute for the bones in terms of providing structural integrity to the limb. But honestly, and I'll, and I'll suggest to you now that if someone has a broken leg, then uh, especially if it's an open fracture, meaning that the bones have come through the skin, then you're gonna treat that person on the spot 
and basically call for an air ambulance or search and rescue to come get them unless you're so far back and you have no alternative but to attempt to get them out to a location where you can get help. This is, you can cause a lot of damage by moving somebody that isn't properly splinted and is, you know, uh, huh, I can't even tell you how much pain they're going to be in, especially if it's a leg. If they're not mobile on their own, then um, you really should be calling for someone to come get them. I'm not saying don't carry this. By all means, do carry this. But once again, understand how to use it and when to use it. All right, so that, and that's one of the bigger items in this kit, isn't it? All right. What are we getting down? Another rice pack. All right, so we're starting to drill down here. Not one, two, three space blankets. Take them out, just take them out, make some room because you're really gonna want that room. Now here's an interesting thing, plastic garbage bag. Um, this is something I would have in my first aid kit if I thought I was, work well, we had them on the ambulance, of course, is because <laughs> you go through a lot of garbage here, right? You don't want all that bloody garbage all over the place. That's what this is all about, is collecting up that bloody garbage so you don't leave it out in the open for someone else to have to handle at a later time. I didn't have this in the kit only because I didn't have the right place for it cleared. And uh, yeah, have these. Have these scissors. Don't try to count on a little tiny pair of scissors from your Swiss Army knife or try to use a knife as people might to try to rip open a pair of pants or a shirt or anything else. Do get a pair of these super scissors or paramedic shears or whatever else you want to call them. These do exactly what they're advertised to do. I can say from experience that I have actually taken off people's construction boots when they had their foot crushed and gone through the leather. I've gone down the side of people's pants right through their belts right through the money in their pocket unknowingly and to be able to take their pants off they usually have to replace them after you cut something heavy like that but they will do the job that they are intended to and they're perfect for that reason and you'll notice that they have this little flange I don't think it's going to show up and that's to protect the person so when you're coming in under something you're not poking them with a sharp pointy pair of scissors so by all means have a pair of this no matter how small your kit is if you can get a pair of these in then you really do want those in your kit tape. Here's what's funny. This is the only roll of tape in this kit. And the other kit did not have tape. Now, I mentioned a couple of different types. People like to carry duct tape, uh, kinesiology tape, uh, different things. By all means, a variety of tape will apply to a variety of situations. This uh, is good good first aid tape. There's just not enough of it. So add first aid tape. You'll find more uses for tape than you, you could believe in your first aid kit. All right, now we're starting to get down to a few more things. Uh, electrolytes, once again, by all means, have them. Two pockets of electrolytes. Uh, okay, we'll leave that one for a second. This one. Glucose. So this is basically sugar, a, a syrupy uh, gel-like sugar. Okay, yes, in a first aid situation, if someone is experiencing a diabetic emergency, specifically low blood sugar, then this will help. It will help and it can have actually be used with somebody who is less than totally conscious. Really, it should only be given to somebody who still has a gag reflex that can still swallow, is conscious enough not to choke on it. Having said that, first aid training often covers applying this person's, this stuff to the inside of somebody's mouth while they lay on their side with the understanding that some of the sugar will soak in through the mucosal membranes or the tissues inside of your mouth and will start to deliver some sugar. This is not a treatment. This is just a transition from being a low level of consciousness to the point where they can eat a proper meal because it won't last. That sugar won't last. Uh, somebody who has had too much insulin, not enough food. It won't last very long. So you do want to be able to follow this up with a proper amount of food to go with it. All right, what else do we have? Band-Aids. Oh, sting relief. Okay, here we go. So uh, remember those, st those sting packages, those sting wipes? Here's a whole package of them. I don't know that we need that many, but you know, okay. Um, so this is a kind of the same thing. Well, actually it is. They're, they're duplicates. This is the treatment relief of pain. So this one has uh, antibiotics. Okay, I'll agree with that. Lip balm, sunscreen, sting relief, uh, white petroleum jelly. That's not bad for uh, 
places where you're starting to get hot spots uh, before a blister. Uh, hydrocortisone, so itch relief, oral pain relief, and ammonia towelettes, that would be sting relief or, uh, uh, as well, and chafing cream. Okay, throw one of these in. You may be able to use it, you may not. Under, again, understand when to use it and how to use it properly. So there was two of those. Uh, okay, so here is prep wounds. So antiseptic wipes for your hands and maybe and even an iodine for a wound. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I can agree with that. If you don't want to use the gloves or you don't have gloves, then you can wipe your hands down with the antiseptic wipes and the hand sanitizer, and even any area around a room. Most people don't like using, or most first aid courses don't recommend using iodine for wounds because uh, yes, it'll kill any bacteria or anything else on or in the wound, but it can also delay healing, believe it or not. So uh, think hard before you use that. If you don't need to, if clean water will do the trick or some type of a light soap, non-irritating soap will do the trick, then Choose that before you choose iodine. Speaking of which, Superwash topical soaps. There, there's two little bottles of uh, soap that you can actually apply and you can actually squeeze and it's got a little nozzle so you can force it into a wound a little bit. You really want to get the dirt out of there. Now, it's in a life and death situation, the dirt in the wound is not the end of the world but it will mean that they're gonna to have to have that wound opened up and cleaned up when they get to the hospital to prevent further infection. So to save their life, yeah, don't bother with this. But if you have the time, the wound bleeding is under control and you're gonna be wrapping it up before transport, then try your best to clean it out if the person will let you because it's not gonna be comfortable, right? But they do give you that, so I consider that, yes, okay, that, that can be used in the kit. Now we're really starting to get down. Medication package, very much like the other one with all the pain relief like ibuprofen and aspirin and all the other things. Um, yep, by all means, one of these in your kit for yourself as much as the other person. Your first aid training will determine whether or not it's appropriate for you to offer for, uh, pain medications to the other person. So yeah, we'll leave that alone. The, tra the training will cover that. Two of them. I don't know that I need two of them. Maybe in that large kit, it's appropriate. Um, these uh, are called, I know I have not used these, but I've used other things like this. This is a, I don't want to say a replacement, but instead of stitching somebody up, it's called a Z-Zip. And basically the idea is uh, when you can bring, we'll say on the back of the hand, a wound together to close it up after it's been cleaned out, after you're assessed to make sure that the bleeding will stop and, and that there's no other structural damage underneath. When you bring it together, and you could, uh, you've heard people talk about using crazy glue. Uh, well, okay, let's just deal with that. Guess what we have? Crazy glue, except this is medical grade crazy glue, if you will. It's a cyclanolate, which is designed for the medical industry. Now, there's not a lot of difference except the quality of the material and the, the formulation of it is such that it will less likely cause irritation and burning than if you just go to the hardware store and buy some. You really, really want to know what you're doing and when it is the time to use it and on what parts of the body, because it doesn't apply to everywhere, before you, you reach for this to close a wound. A serious bleed, that's not the time to use this. Same with this. This is an alternative to using that, or as a backup. If you do decide that you're going to close a wound up with the glue, then you may want to supplement it with this, and this will provide a uh, bridge over the cut area that can be pulled together and that's how they're designed to be pulled together and keep the wound closed. So it's an alternative, at least in the short term, for a proper suturing job. So again, if you have the training, let's put it that way. All right, now we're really getting down to it. Uh, oh boy. Okay, so this is the same thing. This is Some of this has got some real value. There's a whistle, there's a pen light, there's a pair of tweezers, there's a thermometer, and there's thermometer sheets. So um, open it up, take the whistle out. Uh, the thermometer is great. The pen is in here. Oh, pen light, sorry. That's something that's not in this kit, is it? And that's something I will be mentioning. What else? I just want to clear this off. More electrolytes. Look at the band-aids. Look at the band-aids. That's what this is all band-aids. So you get a real assortment of band-aids. Do you need all of them? Maybe, but you know, if I had a scout troop and I was and somebody was taking that pack, I can guarantee that we're going to need a lot of band-aids for the little things that take place. And uh, some of them are not necessarily because they're necessary, but because they help with the person's uh, mental state, we'll say, at the bend. 
Oh yeah, that's another cleaning prep. So there's multiples, as I mentioned. Okay. So what's in here again is the whistle, the thermometer, some sheaths for the thermometer, and a pen light, what it, and tweezers. And tweezers are great for all kinds of things, from removing splinters to removing ticks, and that type of thing. What's not in this kit anywhere is some way of recording what you've done. There's no notebook, no guidelines from what you should be recording from the person, even though they've given you a couple of tools including the pen light and the thermometer for gaining some of that information that you really should be recording. And you will know this, it's, it's called taking a patient history. That's part of every first aid course. Get as much information from the person as you can while they're still conscious because when they go unconscious and can't speak for themselves, the only thing that the first responders will have is what you wrote down. So you want to have things that you can write down with. So some type of a note paper and pen and leave it in the first aid kit so you're not looking for it in uh, in an emergency if you ha if you think you have it elsewhere. So really good idea. Then with the training, you'll know how to use the pen for mostly, well, not just seeing what you're doing if it's dark out, but you'll probably have better lamps, but also for eyes. You can get a, you can see how pupils respond and thermometer because some, some of these things are, you just don't do it once and write it down and not do it again. Most of these, when you're taking those recording those signs and symptoms and history you're doing it on a continuous basis because you want to first off establish what they were at the time of the injury and if it changes for better or for worse you want to be able to record that down okay there's a lot of stuff here right and i've gone through it very quickly and again i haven't talked at all about um, how it's used or accepted on a very superficial basis, but I think you've seen enough that we can wrap this video up. Okay, I know that this has been a video that was primarily me talking, and there was really way too much talking, but as I said in the beginning, I can't show you how to use these things because I don't want you to interpret that as some type of training, which it is not. Again, I advocate strongly, go out and get some training, whether it's a one-day emergency first aid, a two-day standard first aid or 40 plus hour first responder or wilderness first aid training get training it's the best investment it comes much and long before you actually obtain a first aid kit uh, i hope what i've done is given you enough information to start the process of selecting your first aid kit so when you go to the my medic website you'll see a great range of items there not only a range of prepared kits but whole the components so you can actually pick and choose what it is you want to build your first aid kit so they have quite a variety without a question nice thing is they they seem to be always on sale. Every time I go to the site, there's something else on sale. So watch to see what's on sale and uh, maybe pick up the items that you need for your kit as you go. All right. That's all, really. Nothing else to do, say at this time. But what I will do is open it up to you. If you have any comments or question on either of these kits or anything that I said during this video, please put it in the comments section below. All the information that I gave you in terms of where you can take a look at these kits will be in the video description. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.